Sudah, sudah. Okay. Yes. Uh, gimana Mbak? Uh, bisa okay. dimulai sekarang? Uh, I, I'll introduce first. Today our topic is about messianism in the beloved and I. Uh, thank you very much for the attend attending for the Zoom, especially for uh, Sheikh Thomas Petelwen and Sheikh Genti or Sheikh Ahmed. And also thank you for the prayers for Indonesia. We are having a uh, a very uh, a hard, very hard time in Indonesia right now. Today we are starting total lockdown everywhere. So I hope uh, this class would uh, would like uh, bring us uh, spirit. So despite all these hard moments, yes, please. Now we can hear uh, from Professor Thomas about. Yeah, messianism in the beloved and I. Yeah. Time is yours, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that it is continuing so badly in Indonesia with the epidemic. I was given the subject of messianism in the beloved and I, and uh, I promised last time that I would take only three points because uh, I gave five points last time and it was too much for me, even though I tried to keep it simple and leave the complicated things to Gayatri, who understands the beloved and I better than I. I try to just take the simple things. Um, what is a Messiah? It comes from the Hebrew word, uh, Mashiach, an anointed one, anointed with special oil in uh, the time of Israel, priests, prophets, and kings were anointed, and so each of those was a Mashiach. Anointing implies being chosen for a specific task. Now that is the introduction to the word uh, Mashiach or Messiah. Yeah. Jadi uh, mesianisme ini yang berada di Boyeruk al Firkon berasal dari kata uh, bahasa Yahudi, Masia, yang artinya yang diurapi ya, the anointed one, uh, diurapi dengan minyak, minyak khusus ya, minyak khusus. Jadi para raja, para nabi, para pendeta itu uh, dulunya adalah orang-orang yang diurapi uh, juga, uh, mereka diurapi karena mengemban tugas khusus ya yeah. please continue professor now the first point i am taking from genesis 8:9 chapter 8 and verse 9 i have written a commentary that mentions the word messiah for the first time in the beloved and I. It's the commentary, which was the very first commentary of the beloved and I that I wrote. And I wrote it many, many years ago, perhaps not 30, as I said last time, <laughs> but uh, yes, it could be 30 years ago. And uh, it's the commentary, remember Lord of earth and sky, that I eternally spread tiring wings above the seas, that I am but a dove. This um, Brazil commentary, 
introduces messianism in the beloved and I. Okay. Jadi uh, pertama kali beliau menulis uh, tafsir ya uh, Boyrok Al Furqan tentang misianisme ini mungkin 30 tahun yang lalu beliau mengomentari uh, kitab kejadian ya ayat apa 8 pasal 9 ada uh, yang mana yang pasal yang ayat 8 pasal 9 mungkin Mbak Gayatri bisa uh, membantu uh, kitab ayatnya itu jadi Ingatlah Tuhannya langit dan bumi dan sebagainya. Nanti mungkin bisa ditambahkan ya. Khusus ayatnya Kitab Kejadian ayat 8.9 itu ya Mbak Gayatri ya. Jadi okay. di, di situ yang beliau komentari adalah uh, ayat itu yang uh, Profesor Thomas komentari untuk pertama kalinya terkait den, dengan konsep Mesianisme ini. Ya. Ya. Nanti, nanti ya, atau Ya, yeah, please. Aja dulu. Ini yeah. soalnya lagi baru di open. <laughs> yeah, please continue, Professor. Professor. Yes, this this commentary uh, begins with a very negative view of mess of the Messiah or Messianism, and this negative view arises from the focus on nature, the sea, the fish, the birds, um, the light of the sun. It's a very nature-based expression of faith. And I contrast this with the false messiahs the world's hypocrisy, uh, piety, um, the kind of religion that we find in the Abrahamic faiths that are very much tied to books and messiahs, priests and prophets and uh, kings. I contrasted with the simple faith of nature Uh, jadi uh, tafsir uh, tentang ayat ini, kitab kejadian ini uh, dimulai dengan pandangan yang sangat negatif, ya, uh, yaitu pertentangan ya, pertentangan karena ayat ini berbicara tentang ber, berfokus pada alam, tentang ikan, tentang laut, tentang burung, tentang sinar matahari. Jadi sangat sangat berbasis pada alam. Beliau Profesor Thomas mengkontraskannya dengan Mesiah palsu yang uh, uh, tersimbolisasi dalam kemunafikan yang ada dalam agama-agama Ibrahim sekarang, agama-agama yang berbasis uh, Abrahamik sekarang. Ya, jadi beliau mencoba mengkont uh, mengkontraskan antara mungkin uh, agama yang formal yang lahir dari agama Abrahamik faith dengan konsep mesianisme yang berbasis alam bahwa uh, konsep mesianisme itu bisa kita temukan di alam di laut di ikan di burung di uh, sinar matahari yang yang tentu itu bertentangan dengan kemunafikan uh, yang ada di agama-agama yang uh, kita saksikan sekarang please continue At the end of uh, the commentary, I say, make cease the wind and words. And I use this as a symbol of uh, this artificial um, book, uh, messianic prophet, king uh, faith. I call this wind and words. Wind and words. Wind and words, yes. Okay. And I contrast this with out of the long noon and night, create a jinn to open up his heart and take me in. And this is the natural faith, the faith of, of the wind and the sea and the 
uh, trees, the birds, the uh, fish, uh, this faith of the jinn. And I say, for the jinn to open his heart and take me in, save me somehow from this messiah and prophet and king and all of these great people that are so frightening and artificial. Ya, yeah, uh, jadi di akhir tafsir beliau mencoba mengkontraskan dengan uh, apa konsep misianisme yang lahir dari dari pengamatan kita terhadap alam terhadap dunia dengan dengan uh, the, the faith of the jin ya apa dari apa agamanya para raja agamanya para politisi agamanya uh, Ya, organized religion ya, agama-agama formal itu ya beliau mengkontraskan uh, kedua konsep ini. Jadi yang 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 asli adalah yang pandangan yang lahir dari uh, pengamatan kita terhadap dunia kita uh, terhadap alam semesta. Uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, yeah. can you repeat the what what first in the beloved and I? Uh, yeah, which which part of the beloved and I that that you are talking about, Professor Mc? This McElwain? is Genesis Genesis eight and verse nine. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nanti mungkin ditambahkan nanti. Mm-hmm. The first mention of Messiah and the only mention of Jin. Oh, Jin, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The faith of the Jin, yeah. Keyakinannya para Jin, yeah. So, uh, okay. Please continue. Mm-hmm. Yes, there is um, an old concept of, of um, the origin of religion uh, from one of the scholars of more than a hundred years ago, and he uses the uh, Latin word tremendum. tremendum, that is the awe of the so-called primitive, pre-liter- pre-literate uh, people before the powers and the beauties of nature uh, uh, okay. tremendum uh, would you please uh, <laughs> say it once again what is it tremendum this word uh, latin word mm-hmm. tremendum tremendum yes is mm-hmm. the word that we get the english word tremendous from mm-hmm. That is, when we face the natural world, the created world, mm-hmm. it seems tremendous to us. We we see it with awe. Oh, Oke. Okay. Mencengangkan. Mm-hmm. Ya, ya, mencengangkan ya. Jadi uh, konsep mesianisme ini uh, berkaitan dengan konsep lama tentang uh, asal usul agama ya, yang uh, ada kons- konsep bahasa. Uh, kata bahasa Yunani ya tadi. Latin. Latin, Latin, sorry. Tremendum. yang artinya ketika kita melihat alam semesta itu kita uh, merasa tercengang dan apa kemudian konsep agama itu lahir dari dari perasaan tercengang tersebut ya melihat uh, keajaiban alam semesta. Oke. Okay. No, uh, I think that all human faith there is only one faith in the world the human faith. It begins with the awareness of the Creator, and it ends with the hope of resurrection. Okay. And this is the tremendum that we face. Okay. Jadi hanya ada satu keyakinan yang diawali dari kesadaran akan sang pencipta dan diakhiri dengan harapan akan resurrection, kebangkitan ya. itu jadi uh, uh, beliau meyakini satu konsep agama itu jadi hanya ada satu konsep agama yang valid yaitu yang berawal dari kesadaran akan pencipta dan diakhiri dengan harapan akan kebangkitan yes the sense of wonder the sense of creates wonder. in all human beings a belief in the creator and a hope of life after death. Oke. Okay. Jadi uh, perasaan takjub akan uh, ciptaan Tuhan ini mengarahkan orang akan harapan tentang kehidupan 
setelah kematian ya kebangkitan kembali ya, setelah kematian and between these two like a sandwich there are all sorts of religious ways of dealing with present life that yeah. is we meet challenges today how to survive how to live and these challenges come between these two things of wonder the creator and the resurrection and most of our lives are focused on how to live today how to survive how to eat how to relate to other people and our religions are diverse and distinct and manifold become thousands and thousands as we meet daily challenges and it seems that religions are of all kinds but in fact they are all sandwiched in between the wonder that all human beings experience yeah jadi uh, apapun yang terjadi dalam hidup kita, bagaimana kita hidup, bagaimana kita bertahan hidup, bagaimana kita menjalin hubungan dengan sesama manusia, itu semuanya adalah seperti uh, uh, roti yang di tengah-tengah sandwich. Ya, rotinya itu adalah roti uh, ketakjuban akan uh, penciptaan, uh, ciptaan Tuhan, dan harapan akan kebangkitan kembali. Jadi, Walaupun uh, ada begitu banyak agama, ada begitu banyak cara bagaimana kita hidup, bagaimana kita bertahan hidup, bagaimana kita menjalin hubungan dengan sesama manusia, itu semua hanyalah apa namanya uh, daging ya, yang diantara dua uh, diantara sandwich itu, yang sandwichnya itu adalah uh, ketakjuban akan ciptaan Tuhan dan harapan akan kehidupan setelah kematian atau kebangkitan. Yes. Now messianism is part of the middle ground. It's part of that sticky meat in the middle between the slices of bread. The yes. thing that is different in every culture or religion, this sticky meat part in the sandwich. That's where our messianism messianism is. Ya. Jadi dan mesianisme adalah bagian yang di tengah-tengah itu di antara sekian banyak yang lain ya. Bagian yang sticky yang yang lengket yang eh, jadi konsep mesianisme itu eh, juga seperti yang lain eh, konsep-konsep bagaimana kita hidup, kita bertahan hidup, kita ber relate dengan orang lain adalah konsep yang berada di tengah-tengah roti eh, ketakjuban kepada sang pencipta dan keyakinan atau harapan akan kebangkitan kembali atau ya resurrection. And that's why I find it messianism uh, a problem as I look beginning with the beloved and I from the point of view of natural faith from the point of view of an American Indian or um, maybe a Javanese. Uh, We stand in the forest. We find our faith on the edge of the forest. And um, this is why I find messianism a problem and why I present it as a problem to those of us who have a foundation or a strong affinity for preliterate uh, forms of faith. Oke, okay, jadi uh, beliau Profesor Thomas mendapati bahwa mesianisme ini adalah sebuah masalah. Ya, kalau dilihat dari sudut pandang natural faith atau keyakinan yang alami yang uh, diyakini oleh masyarakat asli Amerika, masyarakat Jawa. Karena ketika kita uh, berdiri di tengah hutan, kita menemukan iman kita. Ya, kita melihat ke apa alam semesta kita menemukan iman kita dan itulah mengapa beliau mempresentasikan konsep mesianisme ini sebagai sebuah problem ya sebuah uh, isu yang yang uh, bagi bagi kita yang memiliki apa akar uh, 
terhadap a- 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 asal agama yang yang original yaitu alam ya alam penglihat atau pengamatan kita terhadap alam okay. messianic figures are really at the foundation of um, diversity in faith arguments uh, different religions have different figures that they consider authority and they they conflict with each other in the minds of their adherents uh, jesus is the messiah of christianity of course he is called messiah nine times in the quran but uh, muhammad peace be upon him is is a messianic figure and it does not end there the gospel of barnabas actually makes uh, the prophet to be the messiah instead of jesus and there you see this this conflict one or the other uh, what is it around that, the messianic excuse me what what uh, that makes uh, prophet muhammad the the messiah is it the bible you said the bible uh, the gospel of oh, the, the gospel of Barnabas. Barnabas. Oh, okay, the Gospel of Barnabas. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. Jadi uh, figur tokoh-tokoh Mesian ini juga kemudian berbeda-beda tergantung latar belakang budaya yang mereka menjadikan figur-figur ini sebagai uh, tokoh otoritatif ya, tokoh yang yang ya yang memiliki otoritas ya. Uh, seperti uh, Yesus disebut Mesaya dalam Kristian. dalam kekristenan Muhammad juga disebut Mesaya dalam Islam bahkan disebut Mesaya juga di dalam Injil Barnabas ya. Yes. No, my that is my first point. My second point comes from Genesis 49 and verse 10. 49. Genesis mm-hmm. chapter 49 verse 10. Okay. Okay. And we uh, jump now from the Noah Messiah, which was in Genesis 9, to the Jacob Judah Messiah in Genesis 49. That is, we're going from the natural faith Messiah, the nature faith Messiah, to uh, the Abrahamic Messiah. Ya, jadi poin yang kedua ini beliau uh, mendasarkan tafsir beliau pada Genesis ayat 49 verse 10 ya, yang di situ beliau uh, melompat dari Mesaya versi Nuh ke Mesaya versi Yakub ya, Mesaya versi keyakinan alami. ke Mesaya uh, keyakinan Abrahamik ya. Yeah. Now in uh, I said the first comment was negative. This one becomes actually aggressive. Yeah. You you I hate to present myself first as negative then as aggressive but uh, I'm being very gre- aggressive to uh, the messianic figure. First of all, because I'm very much in favor of natural faith. And uh, now I found an excuse here to be even more aggressive. And that is in Jacob's blessing of his sons. He blesses the 12 uh, sons and This comment is on the blessing of Judah, who is the one who is the father of uh, the Messiah. Okay. Uh, yes. Focusing on a specific awaited uh, savior and Messiah. Yes. As it is understood in, in all of the Abrahamic faiths, Jacob blesses Judah who then is the father of the line in which the messiah should be born. Ya, yeah, jadi kalau yang pertama tadi beliau uh, me, apa, menyebut dirinya negatif karena membandingkan 
natural faith, Mesia dalam natural faith, keyakinan alami dengan Abrahamik, yang ini beliau menyebutnya menyebut diri beliau sendiri sebagai agresif ya, agresif arti karena beliau sangat uh, berpihak ya berpihak pada keyakinan yang berbasis uh, alami ya keyakinan alami eh, keyakinan yang didasarkan pada penglihatan uh, kita terhadap alam semesta. Uh, beliau kemudian uh, uh, mem- mencontohkan uh, blessing yang diberikan Yakub kepada anak-anaknya khususnya Yudah yang Judah ya yang kemudian menjadi ayah dari uh, di mana uh, satu peradaban di mana Mesias nanti akan terlahir di sana. Yes. Now of course um, my commentary establishes the awaited Messiah as a valid figure. This is a central um, expectation and hope of Abrahamic faith. And uh, my commentary accepts this as true. Okay. Jadi tafsir beliau ini, uh, tafs- uh, tafsir yang uh, Profesor Thomas berikan ini menyatakan bahwa Uh, konsep Mesias di dalam uh, keyakinan Abrahamik itu merupakan uh, konsep yang sentral ya dan uh, tafsir beliau menerima ini ya ya. Uh, ya menerima pandangan ini. Yes. I mention here uh, the name Jesus, uh, the name Muhammad. And I also point out uh, Dajjal and Antichrist. Okay. And I make the point that the very expectation itself makes the human heart and mind susceptible to following Dajjal and the Antichrist. And this is the foundation of my aggressive words here that there is a danger. The fact that there is a true Messiah, that there are true prophets, uh, opens the door to the false. If okay. there were no true, there would be no false. But because there are true, then we uh, are susceptible uh, to false ones. Okay. Jadi beliau dalam tafsirnya menyebutkan nama seperti Yesus, Muhammad, juga menyebut tentang Dajjal dan Antikristus. Harapan itu harapan kita terhadap datangnya Mesaya itu membuat kita rentan untuk beresiko untuk mengikuti Dajjal. Inilah bahayanya. Karena kalau ada Mesaya yang asli, pasti terbuka kemungkinan akan ada Mesaya yang palsu dan uh, Ya, karena ada asli, karena ada konsep yang asli, pasti ada lawannya, yaitu konsep yang palsu. Dan kita susceptible, jadi beresiko untuk untuk mengikuti dajjal, karena kita terlalu berharap mengikuti mesia yang asli. Harapan itu sendiri akan mengarahkan kita kepada resiko untuk tersesat. Yes. I take it as a, um, not so much in the commentary, but I would like to point out a historical issue that shows uh, this mentality that I'm, I'm uh, uh, talking about here, this mentality of erring because of the uh, messianic hope. And this we see in the Shiite experience. At first, we see the first person who is called uh, Al-Mahdi is uh, the son of uh, Ali, Muhammad Muhammad ibn Ali, Al-Hanafiya. He is the first one who is called uh, the Mahdi. There was no Mahdi other than he. He was the only choice for many years. And then after his uh, disappearance, 
you have a group of people who is constantly looking for another figure. Well, this one is the Mahdi. This one is the Mahdi. Or this one is, or this one. And we have actually dozens of historical figures who were perceived to be the awaited ones. So you see how this, this mentality is easily comes from the Messianic group. Yeah, beliau Profesor Elwin uh, menyebutkan uh, sesuatu yang bersifat historis ya, uh, bahwa mentalitas ini, mentalitas menanti datangnya Mesia ini adalah mentalitas yang bisa mengarahkan kepada kesesatan, seperti yang beliau sebutkan tentang uh, Syiah, uh, orang-orang Syiah yang menantikan Mahdi ya. Beliau juga menyebutkan bahwa Mahdi yang pertama kali disebut Mahdi adalah putranya Ali, Muhammad Ibnu Ali Al-Hanafiyah. Dan setelah beliau meninggal pun orang-orang masih terus mencari Mesiah yang yang baru, Mahdi yang baru. Oh ini Mahdi, yang ini Mahdi, dan banyak lagi tokoh-tokoh yang kemudian ditetapkan sebagai Imam Mahdi karena mentalitas ini mentalitas menantikan seorang juru selamat ini yes. so the question arises how do we avoid the messianic error the mistake of messianism and this is my third point how to avoid it ya jadi ini poin ketiga beliau bagaimana kita menghindari uh, kesesatan yang bisa lahir dari pandangan mesianik ini atau menantikan uh, so, uh, pandangan atau konsep yang menantikan seorang juru selamat yang bisa menyelamatkan kita ini bagaimana kita bisa menghindari kesalahan dan kesesatan yang diakibatkan oleh uh, konsep ini I use, I use the word messiah for the third time in the beloved and I first was with Noah in Genesis Eight, then with Jacob and Judah in Genesis 49. Now the third time Messiah appears in my commentary on Exodus 20, Ex the Decalogue and Commandments. Hmm. Apa, apa mbak itu mbak Exodus? Kejadian keluaran 20. Keluaran ya, oke. Okay. Keluaran okay. 20, oke. Okay. Ya, yeah. please con uh, continue, sir. Oh ya, yeah. let me translate it first. Jadi beliau tadi yeah. menyebut uh, Mesayah uh, uh, Genesis 8 tentang Noah, kemudian tentang Jacob uh, di Genesis 49. Dan sekarang uh, untuk yang ketiga kalinya beliau uh, menyebutnya uh, dalam penafsiran beliau tentang ayat keluaran, uh, is it 20? Ex keluaran 20. 20, Exodus 20. Exodus 20, ya. Yes. Keluaran 20, yes, please. Uh, this uh, commentary focuses on uh, Tawhid, the oneness of God, in, in the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I develop six ideas in this short commentary. The very center of it says, the blessed Messiah also bows to you. Oh. in worship and so do the prophets too okay so di di uh, tafsir ini beliau memfokuskan kepada konsep tauhid dalam 10 perintah Tuhan ya Ten Commandments dan beliau meng, meng, mengembangkan enam pokok pikiran yang pusatnya adalah bahwa uh, mesiah yang terberkati pun bersujud Uh, kepadamu bersama dengan nabi-nabi. Uh, yes. The, the beloved and I establishes messianism from the beginning with these three um, commentaries as a witness to the sovereignty of Allah or divine proof to use a Shiite term. 
And the argument through this commentary goes through six steps. The first is Tawhid implies divine sovereignty. And therefore, no messianic figure can be valid if it diminishes divine sovereignty. Yes. Okay. Uh, can I translate this? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, jadi, uh, Burik al Firkon ini menyatakan bahwa mesianism ini dengan tiga taf, uh, komentaris beliau, kom, uh, tafsiran beliau ini, poin-poinnya, sebagai kelemahan dari kekuasaan Allah. Ya, argumennya uh, disampaikan dalam enam tahapan. Yang pertama, konsep tauhid mengimplikasikan kekuasaan kemahakuasaan Allah. Ya, jadi kalau ada masih perlu ada Mesias, berarti Tuhan tidak maha kuasa. Kalau Tuhan maha kuasa ya enggak enggak perlu Mesias gitu ya. Oke. Okay. The second one, I make the point: all kings, all messiahs, all men are in submission to Allah and must not and cannot take His glory from Him. To themselves. This is the second point that will prevent us from erring or mistaking. Ya, uh, tahap kedua bahwa, uh, bahwa semua raja, semua orang-orang suci, semua manusia tunduk kepada Allah. Jadi uh, dengan konsep ini, memahami konsep ini, kita akan bisa menghindari uh, kesesatan yang yang lahir dari konsep. Mesianisme ini. And the third point I make in uh, the commentary is that the Messiah also bows to Allah in worship after the example of the prophets. Okay. This is uh, an important issue. It prevents us from erring. A true Messiah also bows to Allah. Jadi, uh... Konsep ketiga, uh, argumen ketiga adalah bahwa para Mesia pun juga menyembah Allah atas uh, dasar perintah dari para Nabi. Jadi pem, uh, ketika kita memahami ini, kita akan terhindar dari dari kesesatan yang ditimbulkan dari konsep Mesianisme ini. And the fourth uh, issue I take up in the commentary is that the whole of creation, all of creation and all created things, you see this goes back to natural faith. All things appear before the one divine face. That is a reference to the Quranic expression of return to the face of Allah. Yeah. Uh... Argumen keempat adalah bahwa keseluruhan ciptaan ini uh, akan kembali kepada Allah. Jadi ini kembali kepada konsep natural faith ya, keyakinan yang alami tadi. Yes. The fifth point I make is that this call to appear before the divine face that we read about in the Quran. is in fact irresistible. That is, we cannot resist it. All things must obey that call. And to understand that also prevents our making a mistake about a messianic figure. Yeah. Poin kelima adalah bahwa semua ciptaan harus taat kepada Tuhan. Ya. Yeah, uh, terhadap seruan Tuhan sehingga dengan memahami argumen ini kita bisa terhindar dari uh, kesesatan yang yang timbul dari konsep menantikan juru selamat itu yes and finally the last two lines of the commentary make the uh, point of what the messianic role is and must be It must be this and nothing else to be a messianic figure. And that is to establish Allah in the human heart, 
to open awareness of the divine names. Okay. Jadi uh, ke sem, uh, kelima argumen sebelumnya mengarahkan kepada uh, tentang bagaimana uh, peran konsep mesianis ini yakni hanya satu menurut beliau yaitu untuk untuk uh, me, me, apa memahkotai hati manusia dengan dengan Allah ya dengan Tuhan dan ya, membuka, membuka uh, kesadaran, kesadaran manusia akan uh, keajaiban uh, ciptaan Tuhan akan keajaiban Tuhan akan kekuasaan Tuhan yes So there it is, the sandwich of uh, human faith begins with Allah is creator and it ends with that Allah brings us back to life on the day of resurrection, Qayyam. And between those two, we have the sticky mess where uh, the messianic figure can be one of error, one of difficulty, or can bring us from creation to resurrection in uh, the proper way. Ya. Yeah. Jadi inilah uh, yang ada di antara uh, sandwich yaitu Allah sebagai sang pencipta dan Allah yang akan menghidupkan kita kembali di hari kebangkitan. Dan di antara dua konsep ini, kita memiliki dan menyaksikan banyak hal seperti adanya tokoh-tokoh Mesias yang bisa membawa kita ke arah kesesatan, tapi bisa juga membawa kita kepada kepada Allah dengan cara yang tepat, dengan cara yang proper. Yes. So there you have the sandwich. Bon appetit. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Mungkin saya akan tambahin nanti sum ya, sumari ya. Jadi sesi kita pada hari ini adalah membahas mengenai mesianisme dalam the bill of NI atau buruk afurkon kalau dalam bahasa Indonesia. Uh, mungkin ada teman-teman yang baru yang belum mengetahui apa itu The Bill of NI atau Buyuk al -Furkon. Itu adalah kompendium Alkitab dan Al-Quran uh, yang ditulis dengan bentuk syair dan berima dan dengan syarahan setiap ayat. Jadi tadi beliau menjelaskan mengenai syarahan yang beliau buat di dalam tiga teks itu tadi saya sudah copy paste di bagian chat komentari yang tadi dibahas itu saya belum terjemahkan ke dalam bahasa Indonesia ya tapi bisa dilihat di situ bagaimana beliau menerjemah apa mensyarahkan teks apa kejadian 8 ayat 9 kejadian 49 ayat berapa tadi ayat 10 kalau nggak salah ya kemudian yeah. keluaran 20 ayat di uh, 1 sampai 17 itu adalah uh, mengenai uh, dekalog jadi tadi yang pertama dibahas adalah beliau menekankan bahwa Sif, uh, sifat dari seperti yang pernah kita bahas sifat dari uh, bilaf NI terutama nasiologi atau uh, tradisi Daudia adalah lebih kepada natural faith natural faith itu atau agama alam agama alam itu seperti agama-agama orang Amerika India agama-agama lokal yang ada di Indonesia yang masih sangat punya connection hubungannya erat dengan alam semesta. Karena ini adalah awal mula sejarah adanya agama di, di peradaban manusia, yaitu ketika berada di alam, kita begitu tercengang, begitu terpesona kepada uh, segala yang terjadi di alam, ya kan? Kemudian kita meyakini di situ ada sesuatu yang agung, yang maha dahsyat. Itulah sang pencipta. 
Dan karena adanya berbagai persoalan hidup yang kita alami, dari sejak zaman kita perlu bapak dulu untuk menintas, kita memiliki suatu hasrat terpendam mengenai setelah mati kita ingin bangkit kembali. Kita mungkin ingin menyelesaikan hal yang belum kita selesaikan. Di dunia mungkin kita ingin abadi hal-hal yang alami juga. Ingat asal mula agama. Dan itu yang dibahas di dalam teks kejadian 8 ayat 9 mengenai asal-muasal mesianisme ketika masih kita seluruh manusia itu masih lebih kepada nature fit. Nah, maka yang dibahas adalah di dalam teks kejadian 8 ayat 9 itu mengenai Nabi Nuh. Nabi Nuh itu ada sosok Mesias, tetapi di dalam konteks masih agama natural pada masa itu. Dan beliau memberi syarah dengan nada yang negatif karena mesianisme yang ada saat ini mengalami disconnection dengan natural faith. Seolah-olah tidak ada hubungannya dengan persoalan-persoalan alam semesta yang saat ini kita hadapi. Misalnya kalau sekarang ada mungkin perubahan iklim, atau mungkin sekarang adalah COVID-19. Yang saya pikir itu ada hubungannya dengan bagaimana kita sudah merusak alam ini. Nah, kemudian yang kedua, beliau memberikan persyarahan uh, yang bersifat agresif di kejadian 49 dan ayat 10. Karena kejadian 49 ayat 10 ini adalah mengenai Nabi Yakub memutuskan memilih di antara 12 anaknya bahwa mereka yang akan mempusakai wilayah ini dan wilayah ini. Ini yang saya sering sebut sebagai mulai munculnya suatu eksploitasi terhadap teks untuk melakukan manifest destiny atau penjajahan atau imperialisme. Nah, inilah masalah dari mesianisme yang kemudian ditanggapi secara agresif oleh Pak Thomas bahwa harapan kita karena kita melihat adanya kerusakan, adanya tirani, adanya hegemoni dan penjajahan, itu bisa malah menyesatkan kita atau malah dieksploitasi oleh orang-orang tertentu, oleh penguasa untuk memilih figur-figur mesias yang keliru, yang justru makin menyesatkan kita atau makin membuat kita tersesat. Nah, akhirnya pada poin ketiga, beliau memberikan contoh dari teks keluaran 20 ayat 1 hingga ayat 17, itu adalah mengenai Dekalog atau sepuluh perintah Allah yang bagi beliau, bagi kami di Daudia itu adalah afurkon yang disebut di dalam Al-Baqarah ayat 53. Pembeda antara benar dan salah, hak dan yang batil. Dan di situ ditekankan bagaimana kita bisa terhindar dari kristianisme yang palsu atau yang tersesat dan yang keliru. Ada tadi, ada enam ya. Uh, intinya adalah Mesias itu tidak mungkin menjauhkan kita dari Allah. Mesias itu tidak mungkin menjauhkan kita dari agama yang asli tadi, yaitu agama alam, natural faith. Ya kan? Kemudian uh, hati kita akan dipenuhi oleh Allah. Seperti yang tadi dibahas di awal, asal-asal agama. Jadi kita selalu akan tercengang, selalu akan merasa tunduk dan sujud dan kagum di hadapan Allah dengan keyakinan kita terhadap mesianisme. Dan beliau mencontohkan, tadi saya lupa, mungkin banyak yang kurang paham, jadi beliau mencontohkan kasus di dalam Syiah. Di dalam Syiah ada sosok yang disebut sebagai Muhammad, uh, Imam Mahdi. Dan sebetulnya Imam Mahdi pertama ada di dalam sejarah yang pernah disebut adalah Muhammad Ibnu Ali al Hanafiyah Secara khusus, secara eksklusif, kami meyakini bahwa beliau masih ada dan masih hidup. Tapi beliau gaib. Dan setelah kegaiban beliau, sama seperti kasusnya Nabi Musa, eh, Nabi Isa atau Yesus, uh, juga kepada Elia, muncullah berbagai sosok figur yang mengaku atau diakui di klaim sebagai Mesias. Nah, karena itu beliau menyodorkan bagaimana cara agar kita terhindar dari mesias yang palsu itu tadi. Intinya adalah kembali kepada tauhid. Mesias yang asli tidak mungkin melepaskan kita dari satu kemanusiaan kita, tidak mungkin membuat kita 
uh, jauh dari Allah dan melakukan kerusakan-kerusakan terhadap kemanusiaan dan alam. Itu mungkin uh, ringkasan dari saya uh, untuk membuka diskusi kita pada hari ini. Namun seperti biasa diskusinya uh, tertutup ya. Jadi kita akan keluar dari Facebook Live saat ini. Uh, mungkin siapa yang host untuk Facebook Live? Uh, mungkin bisa langsung di off Andri. Mas Andri. Uh, saya beritahu ya, beritahu Mas Andri sekarang. Oke. Okay. Ya, silahkan siapa yang mau uh, bertanya, mungkin um, Mbak Wahyuni atau Mas Vicky atau Mas Anam. Halo, apa kabar? Baru masuk nih. Halo, <laughs> maaf tadi ada ke... lagi ngajar tadi. Oh, iya, iya, iya. Uh, Terima kasih. Ya. Silakan, silakan nanya. Oh, enggak nanya. <laughs> Biasanya banyak pertanyaan. Ayo Mas Diki, Mbak Wahyuni mungkin mau tanya. Ya. Uh, ini ag- agak baru pemahaman untuk mes- mesianisme yang dikemukakan uh, dari The Below and I, dari yang saya tahu selama ini. Uh, sepertinya itu lebih kepada lebih cenderung kepada suatu konsep atau bagaimana Mbak Gayatri uh, mesianisme di The Belong MI ini? Karena tadi kan pada akhirnya disebutkan uh, yang penting itu uh, terbentuk uh, suatu perasa uh, maksudnya di, di dalam diri Sanubar itu ada ada terkait dengan uh, Allah gitu ya. Sedangkan uh, dalam Islam yang saya ketahui umpamanya Syiah 12 mereka sangat yakin dengan sosok yang maksudnya yang akan akan muncul yang muncul kembali maksudnya hmm. jadi yang yang ini yang ingin saya tanyakan tafsirnya Pak Thomas yang lebih kepada semacam konsep sementara uh, umpamanya kaum Syiah 12 uh, lebih uh, meyakini pada uh, satu sosok yang yang akan uh, muncul kembali yang yang saat ini dipercaya uh, dalam uh, major occultation. Oke. Okay. So yeah. I, I will help ya. Yeah. Okay. So sir Hatch, uh, my friend here Mrs. Fahyunis asks about Uh, because it seems like you said the messianism is just a general concept, a general ideas here. It's like uh, the three things is just like very general. Is it like that? Because we have been learning, especially like from the travel Shia, that um, Imam Mahdi is uh, is just not is not only concept but it's a, like a, a matter of belief that he will be really return from the major occupation that is her question i i didn't hear the last words you spoke so he, she asks about whether your concept is a really just general concept or general ideas because uh, she has been learning she has been learning that like in 12 she is 12 she are you know there is a it is not only just concept but also it is a, a matter of belief that imam mahdi is really will return from the major occultation and so a, a real Shia, a real trap for Shia must believe in that, must stick on that. So she wants to know about is it the belief and I just concept or also has such belief? Aha, uh-huh. if I understand right, I dealt with a general concepts the as the beloved and i introduces the issue 
but she wants to know what the beloved and I says about um, the detail or the factuality of specifically the Mahdi and uh, the occultation and uh, the, the coming from the great occultation. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the beloved and I um, accepts like I think most Muslims or all Muslims, um, the figure, the series of 12 is maintained in uh, the beloved and I. Uh, and there's the paradigm in Genesis, the first series of 12, the sons of Ismail. And everything after that takes that same model. You have uh, the 12 righteous kings of Judah. You have the 12 judges of Israel. Uh, you have the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, you have the 12 apostles of Jesus. And you have the 12 imams, if we look at all of Shiism and put them all together, uh, you have this uh, series of 12. And these series, the series of 12 is, I use the word divine proof. That is, they are witnesses of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, and they are sinless, they are righteous. And uh, the beloved and I maintains this view that these 12 known figures from Islam are sinless, righteous, and they are divine proofs. They are witnesses of uh, um, Allah, the oneness of Allah. Mm. That is uh, what you will find very clearly stated in the beloved and I. Um, uh, all of these figures are, are respected. The beloved and I actually uh, has a deeper level of, of um, understanding which I referred to uh, in, in the lecture of uh, the identity of uh, the Mahdi. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Mbak Wahyuni, jadi tidak ini karena tadi pendahuan, jadi pembahasannya adalah bagaimana kita membahas mengenai konsep Mesias Bagaimana awal mulanya muncul dan bagaimana kita bisa terhindar dari mesias yang palsu. Tetapi di dalam beberapa NI secara detail ada seperti yang juga kita sudah pernah belajar di kelas nafsologi ya ingat ya itu tentang model 12 kelas itu uh, ingat ya kita pernah belajar dari Ismail uh, kemudian anaknya Ismail uh, 12 pangeran atau uh, putra Ismail kemudian 12 raja raja, 12 putra Daud dan sebagai eh, 12 putra Yakub dan seterusnya. Dan itu uh, juga sebetulnya di dalam debilah NI ada detail mengenai siapakah para Mesias termasuk siapakah Imam Mahdi. Tapi tadi penjelasannya adalah introduction about uh, Kenapa kita ada mesianisme dan kenapa kita perlu mesianisme dan bagaimana kita menghindari dari mesianisme yang keliru, gitu. Uh, Profesor Thomas, I, I would like to ask you, maybe this is uh, important for others here to to know. Sometimes in my mind, you know, I believe that uh, these twelve numbers 
it's uh it's not like uh, people will think that uh, uh like a uh, most mainstream uh the uh, abrahamic faith today you know but i figure out like the 12 sons of ismael and the 12 judges the 12 kings and also the 12 sons of jacob they are the most prominent uh, transmitters you know like we have in indian religions you know they have saptarishi you know they have saptarishi and then after the saptarishi they have others authoritative authoritative figures you know seven here seven there maybe i don't know about jainism maybe also like that what do you think about uh that's in my mind because nowadays people will see that this stuff is it's not about being transmitting but they are just like kings you know like just kingdom you know like you know what i mean yes am i supposed to answer that i want to know <laughs> Well, of course, you, even if you take the names of the sons of Is, Ismail, you have 12, I see them as um, expressions of a spiritual development mm -hmm. that is cyclical, and each name represents a, a, a spiritual state that mm -hmm. is based on the preceding one. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's not so much to identify 12 men who are leaders but to um, join the ishmael light uh, mm. spirituality mm. Thank you. but that's what you were talking about i think yeah <laughs> because i just want to uh to hear from you so that um, the students here would hear directly from you because I have been teaching in Apsiologi that uh, we emphasize them as the transmitters and also that uh, uh, spiritual development because like uh, the first name uh, of like Nebayot and Kedar it's a model and then the next in for example in the 12 imams the bayot and kedar and in 12 imams are ali and hassan and hussein it's just like a model it's not just merely a person no? it's not merely a personal person but this is what lack in our religious lectures especially is this is very deep actually hmm. yeah well you know the number is not just 12 there's also the number seven which is more esoteric and then you find the hadith that mentions the five yeah. and um, of course it all goes back to uh, the one ali who is the first mm -hmm. so it's it's more than just uh, the number 12. Yes. Yes. Okay. Anyone else want to ask? Yang mau tanya lagi? Mas Anam mau tanya mungkin? Vicky atau Vicky mungkin? Saya telat jadi mau nanya apa. <laughs> ya enggak apa-apa. Biasanya juga nanya. <laughs> nanya apa aja. Kan konsep mes apa mesianisme ya, itu mesianisme mungkin sesuatu apa? yang... Uh, mungkin belum familiar gitu ya. Hmm. Ya, mungkin saya. Ya, boleh. Yes. Uh, uh, professor, I would like to know about your personal take, personal opinion uh, related to the concept of resurrection. Uh, uh, what kind of resurrection uh, do you believe in? Is it that uh, 
like uh, everybody dies and then everybody will be resurrected one day together or or do you believe in uh, something different from that like uh, I would like to know about your your personal uh, belief or opinion thank you for that question I'm, I'm very happy to hear it because it's something I'm very happy to say. Um, we talk about the uh, day of judgment or Qayyama, that is resurrection. And I see, I see two different things. I see uh, the spiritual cycle, the weekly cycle and our Sema, which is on Friday night. That is the beginning of the Sabt, in which we have uh, Sema as we have. This is um, a resurrection. It's a spiritual resurrection. And this is uh, in our daily experience, it's the most important resurrection. Mm. But if you read the Quran, carefully, we think that the Quran is the book of Tawheed, that's proclaiming Allah, Allah, Allah is one. There is no God but Allah. You know, that, that idea didn't really cause very much trouble or excitement or opposition. The opposition that the Prophet got was from people who ridiculed him when he said the man died, he rotted, there were bones lying in the desert, and he resurrected in the body, alive again as he was. This is the terrible thing, the incredible thing, the thing that bothers people. You know, even in the New Testament, uh, the prophet was not the only one to, to experience this. Uh, the apostle Paul, when he went to Athens to preach in Athens, they listened to him until he said the body, the resurrection of the body. Then they threw up their hands and said, very politely, we will listen to you another time. They were willing to hear Tawheed, but they were not willing to hear the resurrection of the body. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I apologize, but it's the same for the prophet himself. Mm. So actually, Hajj, if I can, I can help my brother Rahmat here. Uh, yeah. My brother. No, no, no. I, I can help myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he wants to know whether you also believe something like Gilju or reincarnation, you know? Yeah, something stuff like, like that. that. Ah, reincarnation. Reincarnation. You know, reincarnation is... Uh, Well, you know, there are different uh, ideas about reincarnation. Yeah, this uh, order of um, dervishes, uh, reincarnation is, is a rather common belief. Um, You, you should have asked about reincarnation instead of resurrection. <laughs> uh, you know, even in Judaism, there is a belief in reincarnation. It's very limited, but it exists. I don't know what to say personally about reincarnation. Um, I, th I think we need to keep a mind that is open to various possibilities of reincarnation. It's not something to deny, certainly not to deny. Uh, 
Uh, do you, did you want to know what I personally believe about reincarnation? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I, what, what I am asking is that because uh, there, there has been a commentary on uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, verse 28, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and then, yeah, verse 20. And, and then uh, the commentator said that the, the verse refers to the concept of reincarnation. And uh, further, he, he, what is it, explains that uh, reincarnation is, is uh, the true meaning of, of the concept of resurrection that uh, Prophet Muhammad was implicitly trying to tell people or trying to, yeah, about. Well, you know, I don't think that one cancels out the other. Uh, uh, the uh, resurrection of the body that we referred to in the Qiyamah is an, a, a, a Quranic teaching and a biblical teaching that's very clear. And I would affirm it, the, the reincarnation cannot diminish that or, or mitigate it or oppose it. Uh, reincarnation is another issue that goes on in the sandwich, in the sticky part uh, between the bread. So we can think of different possibilities there, but the, um, the, the slices of bread remain, the Tawheed remains, the creator remains, and the resurrection remains. The hope of resurrection, right? But between them, there's a sticky yeah. area where reincarnation uh, certainly exists. Interesting. As a belief and maybe as reality as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, was, I took my wife uh, many years ago to um, a healer in Finland, here in Finland. Um, and in the waiting room, I was sitting there and the healer came out and said, this other man here, he is a, a fortune teller. He can tell you about your past life and all of these things. So I was talking with him. He said, I'll tell you about your future. And uh, he said, in three years, you will go to Tasmania for a job. And uh, about three years later, it was funny. I went to the university and one of the professors came to me and said, here, there is a job in Tasmania. You can have it if you like. <laughs> And he said, I will also tell you about your past. He looked at me and he said, um, you are the reincarnation of um, Muhammad. No, not Muhammad, Ali. You are the reincarnation <laughs> of Ali. <laughs> yes, Ali Haida. <laughs> so I would like to believe in reincarnation. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And, and as you were saying that it, it, it doesn't cancel each other, yeah? Both concepts don't cancel each other. Yes. Exactly. Or the, uh, the other may be just a, like a further, uh, further what? Uh, explanation or further, oh. yeah, further explanation of the, the previous one or like, because maybe at that time, uh, things, uh, the, at the time of Prophet Muhammad, things sh should be, uh, told to people uh, implicitly, not not like a, uh, unlike the the other what is it civilization, Indian civilization, where these teachings were were spread uh, quite openly, like uh, uh, the, these concepts were thought quite openly to people. So like mm -hmm. um, maybe it, uh, it was different uh, with the 
the, with Prophet Muhammad and his people. Things may need to be uh, said like implicitly, not not secretly. explicitly. Yeah, <laughs> not secretly necessarily, but <laughs> implicitly. Like like the the point uh, need to be uh, told to people, but uh, in an implicit manner. That's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's that's what I what I've been believing. <laughs> Well, yes, it's a reasonable approach, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, mungkin aku mau terjemahin ke teman-teman yang lain ya. <laughs> ya, silakan. Menerjemahnya, <laughs> Mbak. Kayaknya teman-teman yang lain ini agak bingung. Jadi, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yang ditanyakan oleh uh, Rahma tadi adalah mengenai kepercayaan pribadi dari Pak Thomas. Apakah beliau percaya mengenai konsep selain dari kebangkitan tubuh? Uh, yaitu reinkarnasi uh, dan beliau pendek kata menjawab bahwa uh, ya saya ingin percaya dan saya tidak tidak akan menafikannya tetapi bahwa kepercayaan itu terhadap reinkarnasi tidak menghapus kepercayaan terhadap kebangkitan tubuh dan kedua-duanya adalah kepercayaan yang bisa berjalan berkiringan dan uh, apa Uh, saya pikir itu jawaban yang pendek dari beliau. Uh, so Hajj, I, I, I was also thinking like this. You know, most natural beliefs, most natural faiths that I have learned as so far, I'm not like you who are, who is a, who is an anthropology of religion. You know, I have been learning so far that most natural faiths believe in resurrection and the incarnation uh, that does not cancel each other. Uh, you know, like uh, when I watch the, the documentary about people in Orengo in Africa somewhere, and they believe that uh, when you are born as a woman, uh, you are already perfect, actually. I like that idea, actually, no? <laughs> because It means so much, like, it creates a very beautiful society in that island, in that island of Orengo. So they really respect women. But when you are born as a man, you must do hard so that you can be born again as a woman. <laughs> It's a very, a very beautiful idea of you, faith, you know, for me, as if I can see it as person outside the society you know so what do you think about uh, my observation that most natural faiths actually hold that well you know i come from a matriarchal society so uh, that's interesting born as a man and born as a woman Uh, some people in English, they refer to women as an old cow. And uh, perhaps uh, after being born as a woman, you can be born as a cow in India. It's even better than being a human being. So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> mbak, mbak, ada tanya nih. Mbak, okay. Mas Vicky. Always getting <laughs> higher. <laughs> is be man, woman, cow. <laughs> yeah. Saya juga mau ini. Okay. Ini, ini, Vicky, Vicky ini bertanya ini, uh, and I, I, I would like to translate it for you, uh, Professor. Oh, ini bertanya. Buka ya, Tri, kayaknya. Ya, buat Mbak Gayatri, Mbak Gayatri. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Hmm, okay. oh. oh, so someone asks here whether the messianism, the messianism oh, is always oh, come from, from the Eastern, yeah, Eastern. geographical Eastern. region, you know, like. Uh, Mesopotamia, India, maybe Indonesia. <laughs> I think it's better you answer because this is uh, in the field of anthropology of religion. <laughs> <laughs> Indonesia is not. <laughs> What is the question exactly? <laughs> the question whether Messianism only or uh, usually uh, comes from the Eastern worldview, Eastern. Regions, right? 
Mesopotamia, India, China, Arab. Arab. India, yeah. yeah. The religion. The are we talking about reincarnation still? Or? No, no. The messianism. The messianism. Uh, this is tra- is trying to get uh, the confirmation from you. Is messianism always oh. coming from the east, or 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 Mes- not? Messianism. You know, we began with a, a biblical definition of messianism. The word is is biblical, Mashiach, which is a chosen, anointed with oil. A man who has chosen to be a king, a priest, or a prophet. That's the basic meaning of the word. And it's a Semitic word. So the, the concept itself is, is localized. Um, it's it's a, a Hebrew concept. Even in the Quran, it's borrowed from Hebrew. Mm-hmm. And it, so, you know, Gautama and uh, uh, Lao Tzu and um, uh, Confucius, oh, these are not messianic figures. Mm-hmm. They, these are, they really grow out of nature religion. Mm. Problematic messi- messianic mm. figures actually come from the Abrahamic faiths. Or from, uh, yes, the Eastern Mesopotamian um, God kings, divine kings, divine kingship. That's uh, typical of that area. So it's a, it's a really a Near Eastern or ancient Middle Eastern uh, concept that has globalized through um, Christianity and Islam. But it's not a far eastern concept, in, in my view. Uh, my knowledge is very limited, mm-hmm. but uh, okay. I, I don't see okay. it so much. Messianism is not so much um, an, a far Asian view, it's not a Chinese concept, it's not a, an Indian concept, or Malaysian, or Southeast Asian concept. And you know, it, that's where the nature religions are more visible. Um, there's a more visible foundation of nature religions mm. in the Far East mm. than in Mesopotamia. Mm. And it, I think it's uh, actually a plus. <laughs> mm. And the same for the Americas. The Americas are very much so, Asian. So, I, I'm sorry to uh, cut. So, do you mean that the messianic figures in India, like uh, Gautama, Kaki, uh, Kaki Avatar, or Maitreya, or Lao Tzu, uh, or maybe Mahavira, uh, are different in concept than in the Near East? Yeah, I think they're different in concept. They're not really messianic. Uh, You have avatars, Mm -hmm. um, incarnations of gods and goddesses. Um, You have reformers, the spiritual reformers that you referred to. Um, That's very typical in India. Uh, Lots of those. but they're not really messiah figures. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. They're more spiritual than messiah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can I, I ask, uh, maybe because this is the different world view because of the historical experience by saying like, when I read the Genesis, from example, from Genesis uh, 4 or 5, yeah, about a set, you know, set repressing uh, K, uh, Abel, set repressing Abel, it's starting to see uh, the growing of uh, Sumeria, the growing of kingdoms in 
the region of Mesopotamia and uh, all around that area in Bereshit, you know, around that four waters. Um, that these kingdoms, these, these empires, they are being very greedy. They are being uh, so oppressive to the people around them so that the sages, the saints, or the prophets in that region are those actually who want to uh, go against them or to recover the people from this oppression. So then this messianic figures also meant for such thing. It, uh, it's not just a, a, an individual spiritual recovery, but also the society now, not also not only just individual, but also all society. The now is not only individual, but also the group now. You know, so they want to recover this. And we did, did this again, discussion get into uh, Indonesian language? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will. I will. I will, I will. I will translate it should be. later. Okay. I will. Nanti akan ya. Can you what what do you think about this? Uh, oh yes, yes, that, that's more or less what I said. <laughs> yeah. In more detail, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh Vicky, tadi pertanyaannya adalah mengenai apakah konsep mesianisme ini berasal dari geografis dan tradisi timur. Yang dimaksud timur di sini di mana? Karena Timur di sini ada timur dekat ya, near east, near east itu berarti Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia itu peradaban Mesopotamia itu termasuk uh, peradaban Semit, ya Arab semua itu termasuk near east, kemudian ada far east, timur jauh yang seperti kita ini timur jauh, nggak tahu jauhnya di mana, <laughs> ini padahal dekat banget sama kita ya, nah, tapi intinya adalah konsep mesianismenya near east, timur dekat dengan konsep mesianisme India uh, itu beda, itu lebih seperti yang saya sering katakan, itu lebih kepada individual spirituality. Uh, kemudian di Cina, Jepang, Pasifik itu tidak ada uh, konsep mesianisme, karena latar belakang pengalamannya yang berbeda dan lebih dekat dengan natural faith, dan sebetulnya Pak Thomas menganggap itu suatu kelebihan dari kawasan kita yang tidak mengalami seperti di Mesopotamia. Kenapa ada figur-figur mesianisme? Karena adanya empirium-empirium yang besar, kekaisaran-kekaisaran agung yang begitu menindas kemanusiaan, sehingga para resi di sana, para nabi di sana, para rasul di sana, mencoba memulihkan keadaan itu, mencoba mengeluarkan permasalahan itu, dan Konsep mesianisme itu juga kemudian secara natural tumbuh di situ bahwa dengan cara itu mereka akan dikeluarkan dan diselamatkan dari penindasan dan mereka harus bergabung dengan uh, sosok mesianisme untuk keluar dari penindasan dan memulihkan kehidupan dari penindasan hegemoni kerajaan-kerajaan yang tumbuh itu. Nah, kita melihatnya dari Sumeria awal peradaban di Okay, I, the, uh, Mr. Ahmed uh, would like to ask something to Professor, please, uh, Mr. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum, salamat sabd to everyone. Shalom. Salam. Uh, if Professor Thomas said that his knowledge is limited, and uh, I would say that I have zero knowledge. So, in my zero knowledge, I will make just three simple remarks that I realized from this lecture, and not very much difficult. I will keep it short. The first point that Professor made is the concept of pre natural faith. He mentioned, he mentioned there that he mentioned the lack of hypocrisy in the pre natural faith when he spoke about the first case of the Messiah in the Genesis 8. So my point is lack of hypocrisy. Second point is the, the Jacob blessing Judah. And then we have the real example of the Abrahamic Messiah, which thing 
which we get the, under, the real understanding of a messiah. And the third point about how to differentiate a real messiah from a, from a false messiah, the sixth point that he made. Basically, I've been asking myself my whole life, why there are so many religions? Be because I come from a secular background in my, or like a place where I come from. So why, 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 why there are so many religions? Why there are so many things? So with this, with these points, we can make very simple conclusion. By being free of hypocrisy and realizing the real Tawhid, the real understanding of the primordial faith and the real, then the real understanding of the real model that the scripture is giving us, especially the Decalogue that he, the prophets quoted. And then we re, when we lack hypocrisy, we will not fall, not just for any false messiah, but not even for any false wali, any false, any false saint, or any false preacher, or any false guru. Pretty much, with this point, you can be safe from everything fake. And you don't need to resort to perennialism or the, or the so-called interfaith dialogue, which is nothing but a false preachers gathering with each other. With this, the point the professor made, without making much complications, you can distinguish if you're sincere, that sincerity is whether you are illiterate or illiterate, uh, no matter where the background you're coming from, you can understand the real, who is the real Messiah, who is the real God, who is the real saint, who is the real preacher, who is the real everything. This is pretty much, and what's the real, real faith, the real natural faith that is beyond all established religions. The rest is said by Gayatri and the professor. So the professor, I wanted to ask, can we implement these points in every, in distinguishing every false person out there who is just fooling people from time history to till, till nowadays. That's it. We can use this for everything, to distinguish everything. That's it. In my opinion, this is, and we can present the people with the real faith without resorting to perennialism. Because so many people are confused and why we have so many religions. These teachings of professor can simply, can work with everyone from every country, every culture, every race, every civilization. That's it. And can distinguish the false from the right. But that's my opinion, very simple. So what the professor can be, how can we apply these concepts regarding the Messiah in every other aspect, false prophets, false saints, false gurus, false peers, false sheikhs, etc. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will I will translate them better. Can you please give your opinion, Hatch? Yes. Maybe uh, someone will uh, say in Indonesian what he said because it, it's very favorable to me. I will, I will, I will explain in Indonesia. Can you give your opinion on uh, Sheikh Ahmed's emphasis? Well, he praised what I said very highly, so of course I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, okay. So you want people to know that you are being praised here? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. I will, yeah. People will know, <laughs> we'll find out that you are being praised so highly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. uh, okay. Monggo. Uh, uh, tadi? Uh, jadi, bagaimana menerapkan pemahaman terhadap konsep ini untuk uh, membedakan mana yang benar dan yang salah dalam hidup kita? Dan itu uh, bisa dalam berbagai aspek ya. Bisa mana guru yang benar, mana yang nabi yang benar, mana imam yang benar, mana apapun yang benar. Uh, bagaimana konsep ini bisa bisa dijadikan sebagai pembeda begitu ya maksudnya. Uh, mm -hmm. Mungkin seperti itu. Ya, tiga yes. hal yang tadi mengenai kemunafikan, yeah. kemunafikan dan kenapa ada agama yang Tadi dijelaskan oleh Pak Thomas, agama yang natural, agama yang alamnya, itu seperti kita bisa temukan di agama-agama lokal kita, orang Badui, orang Samin, orang apa ya, Dayak, ya, 
yang ketika mereka berada di hutan, ketika mereka ada di gunung, ada di laut, begitu mencekam adanya keindahan, ya kan? Begitu takjub kita oleh semua itu, sekaligus tercekam kita kan, kalau kita berada di alam yang luas itu kan. Nah, dari situ kan muncul agama, keyakinan, ada sesuatu ini, something gitu kan. Nah, kemudian juga karena kehidupan kita sehari-hari yang begini, eh, begini berat kadang-kadang ya, kita menghadapi COVID ini sekarang misalnya, tentu kita juga ingin sedih. Kita kan ngomong, kalau ada saudara kita yang meninggal atau sahabat kita yang meninggal karena COVID, kita ingin ketemu lagi dengan dia di, ya kita sampai ketemu di, di alam berikutnya. Itu kan satu ekspresi kita ingin hidup kembali, resurrection. Kita ingin ketemu lagi sama waktu waktu rahmat sakit itu kan, aduh rasanya <laughs> ingin segera rahmat itu resurrection dari sakitnya. Ya, <laughs> I want you to be resurrected from your COVID at that time and you were so You know your condition when you you got COVID, Rahmat. He he just got COVID, you know, a few weeks ago, and it kills my heart so deep that oh Rahmat, I'm so afraid he he will go to death, you know. <laughs> But so I keep praying and praying so that Rahmat will get healed, and Alhamdulillah now Rahmat has already resurrected from COVID. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so that is how. Jadi itu adalah bagaimana cara kita melihat uh, bahwa um, bag- tadi yang dicapaikan oleh uh, Syekh Ahmad adalah supaya melihat ini sederhana aja agama natural dan kemudian ada muncul mesianisme adalah supaya tidak ter- masuk ke dalam mereka yang hipokrit. Hipokrit yang serakah, yang kemudian juga uh, hanya ingin mengeksploitasi harapan-harapan kita, ingin sehat, ingin kembali normal, dan lain sebagainya. Dengan adanya mesianisme, itu malah dieksploitasi harapan kita. Atau kita sendiri jangan terlarut oleh um, harapan kita tentang mesianisme, sehingga kita bisa diajak ke hal-hal, yang palsu seperti guru yang palsu atau imam yang palsu ya kan dan seterusnya dan seterusnya itu yang dimaksud oleh uh, apa Ahmad ya Ahmad ya yeah. thank you huh. so maybe we still have 15 minutes you know we still have 15 minutes ya yeah. professor you, you still have like uh, about 15, 15 minutes, minutes to, to so if ada yang masih mau tanya silahkan Ya, Verita. Verita. Uh, professor has an answer actually. Professor Professor Thomas has an answer uh, Mr. Ahmad's question. Please continue answering. What, it. what was uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmad's question? Oh, you, 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 you don't complete as a question. <laughs> okay. Kayaknya lebih banyak kopi ini tuh. <laughs> lebih banyak kopi nihnya Pak Rahmat. Eh Mas Rahmat. Please continue the question, Professor Ahmad. Maybe you should. Uh, oh, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm not a professor. Oh, sorry, sorry, but doctor. <laughs> sorry, doctor Ahmad. <laughs> no, can we use can we use these concepts of messianism and how to distinguish a false and a fake messiah? And the points that I made for everything: fake religious person, fake saint, fake uh, preacher, fake everything. In life and preach the natural faith to the all people of the world without re- resorting to perennialism in this way that professor made points like the points that professor made can be used in many other ways that's it well yes you know i have very often made the point that the decalogue is fundamental it's a rule of thumb It's um, Furqan. It is the uh, measure of right and wrong. And uh, those six points that I brought up in that commentary, that is in the commentary of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. So definitely, 
this is one way of viewing the principles of the Decalogue. Those six points that I made are uh, they're deduced from the first commandment, Tawheed. Um, I take some points of logic. I take uh, one or two points from the Quran, um, one or two points from the New Testament, and uh, then give a role of, of a true messianic figure. Those uh, issues can definitely be used to um, evaluate anything, an individual or movement, or doctrine or belief or religious tradition, uh, those uh, specific issues are, are fundamental for evaluating. So I would say you are right. Uh, yeah, I didn't make that point, but you're quite right to make it. Yeah, jadi konsep mesianisme ini bisa menjadi bisa di apa ya menjadi tool ya menjadi alat untuk sebagai furkon ya sebagai pembeda juga ya. Jadi ketika kita memahami konsep mesianisme ini dengan benar, maka kita juga bisa dalam berbagai aspek kehidupan mengenali mana yang benar. Mana yang salah, mana pergerakan yang benar, mana pergerakan yang dimotiv dimotivasi oleh niat yang benar, mana pergerakan yang dimotivasi oleh niat yang salah, mana guru yang yang uh, mengajarkan hal yang benar dalam artian ajarannya datang dari dari kebenaran hidup, mana yang dimotivasi oleh duniawi yang dalam hal ini salah. Jadi bisa diterapkan dalam semua aspek kehidupan untuk membedakan mana yang benar untuk mengenali mana yang benar mana yang salah ya. dan itu tulisnya ada di Al-Furqan yang sebetulnya adalah 10 perintah Allah jadi 10 perintah Allah ini ada di peradaban lain dengan nama lain misalnya Niyamas dan Yamas ya kan atau Pancasila Pancasila Buddha ya bukan Pancasila ideologi politik itu lah, bukan atau kalau di Jawa ada Molimo ya kan Ojo tidak boleh ngebunuh, nggak boleh apa ngambil istri orang. Itu kan ada tuh mau limo kalau di Jawa. Hmm. Ada di prinsip pasif, ada di lima prinsip konfusius, dan seterusnya. Jadi di Kalk itu ada di semua tempat dengan nama yang berbeda. Itulah Al-Furqan yang menjadi uh, dasar dari enam pokok pikiran yang tadi dibahas oleh Pak Thomas mengenai mesianisme. Nah, Oke. Okay. Ibu, oh, ada ada pertanyaan ibu, uh, saya mau tanya nih. Iya, iya. Saya mau tanya, tapi sedikit menanggapi yang Bu Gayatri tadi omongkan ya soal konsep mesianisme, Ibu. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jadi bukan Pak Thomas ya, ini malah ke Bu Gayatri. Berarti saya nanti aku menjawab. jawabnya pakai bahasa Inggris ya, ya Pak Thomas. Ya, gak apa apa, gak apa apa, biar Pak Thomas juga tahu ya. Aha. Dan kita berbagi sharing diskusi ini biar berguna juga. Ibu, Ibu kan bilang kalau konsep mesianisme ini muncul karena penindasan ya Bu ya, penindasan yang muncul di kalau dia dari berasal dari daerah dekat seperti Sumeria atau budaya Semit itu kan karena ada imperium. Nah saya jadi terpikirkan di Nusantara kita, saya terseret itu oh, ada ada juga gitu Bu. Jadi di Nusantara sendiri khususnya di Jawa itu seperti wali songo itu juga bisa disebut mesia apa bisa disebut mesia konsep mesia muncul konsepnya mesianisme juga bu wali songo itu oke okay, thank you so ya, mr thomas uh, this actually a question for me so i will answer in, in, in english oh, okay. i'm sorry professor thomas Verita understand my English because uh, this is Indonesian English, <laughs> not uh, British English. Not really pure, pure English. I'm sorry, okay. Professor. So the question is about uh, messianic figures in Indonesia. She asks whether the nine wali or the wali songo is the messianic figures in Indonesia. So I will answer like this. Uh, based on my scholarship as historian, okay, uh, the word Wali Songo is actually from the word Sangha. 
Sangha is in from the Buddhism or perhaps also Hinduism the concept of uh, conference, conference of the sages, conference of the saints. So they use the word nine, does not mean just only nine, no, not only nine, but perhaps it's a symbolic meaning of the nine direction. We have the eight direction, you know, west, east, uh, north, and south, and southeast, and etc., and the center. So we have nine, right? So all these um, saints or sages comes from western of Java, north of Java, uh, south of Java, and they uh, they are gathered in a conference. So they call it as Wali Song or Wali Sangha. Uh, so I don't think they are messianic figures, but uh, I believe they have taken a role so that the Islamic tradition still existed or performed in a good way during the 14th century, since the Demak, since the kingdom of Demak, since the kingdom of uh, Pajang, uh, before Demak, I think also. So Islam uh, has already been spread in Java, especially this Pali Songo is especially in Java, not outside Java. I don't really think it has a significant meaning outside Java, not in Sumatra, not in Malaysia. Of course, in Sumatra, they have their saints, they have their wali, but it, it is the concept in Java. Uh, and Java includes Madura and includes all the islands, like perhaps uh, Little Sunda. I think Little Sunda Islands also includes this. So, um, they are not missionary figures, I don't think so, but they are helping to maintain Islamic tradition because there are already many people who embrace Islam uh, in the 14th century. And I'm afraid that some, some of them, some of them has also been exploited by uh, the newly kingdoms for occupying other communities in Java uh, so that they become Muslim. I'm afraid that also happened, but most of them are just trying to maintain Islam because most people already embrace Islam and the kings especially, the kings already embrace and become Muslims. Jadi, uh, Mereka itu bukan figur masyarakat, tapi ingin memelihara keislaman, tradisi Islam di dalam masyarakat Jawa. Walaupun ada sebagian, saya pikir ada, saya ingin bersikap kritis di sini, ada sebagian yang dieksploitasi atau mengeksploitasi untuk kepentingan hegemoni dan islamisasi. Termasuk ketika pasca Mataram. The problem is, after Mataram, we have a very big problem after Mataram. It becomes uh, empire of Islam in Java that has the manifest destiny ideology. But that's also not really their sins, not really their faults. I mean, bukan salah, benar-benar salahnya mereka. Why? Because the Europeans are coming. The Europeans were coming to Indonesia, you know, to monopolize the spices trade, the gold trade, yeah? So yeah. they have to do something against these European attacks. So they choose Islam to fight against these uh, European uh, fights. You remember uh, Malacca 1511? Malaka 15-11, yeah. 15, 11, yeah. They yeah. are trying to monopolize the trade in uh, Southeast Asia, especially spices yes. uh, and other yeah. products, you know, like camphor, seperti kapur, yeah. So this is my answer.
Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank that, you. That, that the time is almost up. <laughs> yeah, we have six minutes left. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah sorry. Have any uh closing statement, Arch Thomas? Yeah. I've already spoken too much. No, we. <laughs> I think I'm the one who spoke too much. Wah, dia masih mau nanya, tapi waktu udah habis tuh. Ini never mind, gak apa-apa ya. Oh iya, never mind, bu. Okay. Um, maybe I would like to. Oh, hmm. gimana you ini? You translate. You translate. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Thomas ini. This is a, a question from last Fiki. question. Last the question. last question Fiki from again, the last question. Yes. To to Professor Thomas, yeah. it is still related with geography. Uh, oh. All those messiahs uh, in their doctrines were were teaching with in their own language, uh, lang uh, and culture. Yeah, it, it includes uh, how. Uh, to to say prayers, how to do, how to perform the rites. Then, why does the language uh, play a very significant role in relation with with the faith? And yeah, why why has the language been playing a very important role and uh, been very highly? correlated with, with, with the faith? And why hasn't this changed? Oh, well, you see. Yeah. I think, I think the beloved and I is um, mm. the Bible and Quran for our time when the English language has unfortunately become globalized so that before that, it was Arabic and Latin, mm -hmm. Greek and Hebrew. Now so, it's English with the beloved and I. So you're saying that it's not true, yeah? So it has changed, yeah? Well, yeah, it has changed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Jadi enggak, enggak, we can change it. We yeah. can change it. Jadi it's not true that it's not Jadi sudah berubah. Sekarang buktinya berubah. bahasa Inggris yang sekarang... Uh, yeah, has played a very so, important so now, role. Yeah, yeah. You so only maybe, need, you only need English and Javanese now. <laughs> yeah, bener. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, bener. Saya juga tahu sih ada beberapa tetangga saya juga berdoa dengan bahasa Jawa sih. Yeah. Okay. So maybe his question is like, if we can perform solat, we can perform namas in English or in Javanese or in Malay and not in yeah. Arabic because like I. I don't have relationship with Arabic language. I feel like I'm not Arab, you know. I'm not Jewish. Can I speak to God with my own language? This is maybe yeah. the the basic question. That's the question. The question. You yeah. you know, there's a, a an old Hanafi verdict that mm -hmm. uh, says that you can do namaz in native language, not Arabic. Oh yeah. Jadi ada keyakinan di actually in Islamic history. Yeah, it doesn't come from me, I'm telling Hanafi. you. Uh, yeah. Islamic history. Keyakinan uh, mazhab Hanafi, mazhab Hanafi boleh itu. Jadi dengan bahasa kita sendiri boleh. Jadi ya itu bahkan juga sudah berubah kan it has changed. Jadi tidak benar bahwa selalu demikian, selalu berubah. So, gimana ini? Yeah, mungkin uh, so, after this we can have pictures together. Yeah, we can have pictures. Mm -hmm. So this is yeah our. Uh, so before webinar. that, I thank you very much. The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the discussion well, today. You thank so you very much. much for all of you who comes, and we shall meet again next Sunday. Uh, and if you have other question that you still want to ask, you can still send the question to me through emails or through my WhatsApp. And we shall have answered that in the next meeting. I want to also say that in the next meeting, we will have a lot of talking more than just uh, uh, drama, you know, more than just uh, talking from the uh, Sheikh Ahmad. But we, we want you to discuss everything about what we have been talking so far about messianism, about nafs and all next week.
I hope we are all here healthy, especially in Indonesia. Please take care of yourself. Please yeah. uh, be happy, you know. <laughs> be, uh, be semangat, ya. Yeah? Be semangat so that we can have a good immune to deal with this COVID. Uh, thank you very much. So we, we can have pictures now. Siapa yang mau ambil foto? Mbak Verita, Mas Diki dihidupin dong, Pak Anam, Vicky, yes, Mas Vicky, yes. Mas Vicky. Everyone. No. Yeah. If, you, if you feel like your pictures <laughs> to be taken. Ya, yeah, okay. Mas Vicky. Ya, yeah, yeah, silakan. Mas Diki, Mas Anam, Pak Anam, Mas Yulistio. Terima kasih. <laughs> udah belum nih? ini? Uh... Saya sih udah foto ya ini. Ya udah, Ap- udah Oh, gitu. sebentar, sebentar. Ya, sebentar. Oke, di Kiva baru muncul di. Ya, <laughs> lagi dong, lagi 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 lagi. Ya, lagi. itu dong, lagi, pakai lagi. aba-aba, aba-aba. Iya, pakai aba-aba ya. Tadi. 1 2 3. 1 2 3. Satu lagi, satu lagi nih baru kita kemecat. 1 2 3. Oke. Satu lagi, satu lagi. Satu Yule still enggak enggak buka kamera ya sama Artati. 1 2 3. Oke, sudah. Yes, yes, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank, you. thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, 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 thank